chapter name Francis of G. K. Chesterton's Twelve Types. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Asceticism is a thing which, in its very nature, we tend in these days to misunderstand. Asceticism, in the religious sense, is the repudiation of the great mass of human joys because of the supreme joyfulness of the one joy, the religious joy. But asceticism is not in the least confined to religious asceticism. There is scientific asceticism, which asserts that truth is alone satisfying. There is aesthetic asceticism, which asserts that art is alone satisfying. There is amatory asceticism, which asserts that love is alone satisfying. There is even epicurean asceticism, which asserts that beer and skittles are alone satisfying. Wherever the manner of praising anything involves the statement that the speaker could live with that thing alone, there lies the germ and essence of asceticism. When William Morris, for example, says that love is enough, it is obvious that he asserts in those words that art, science, politics, ambition, money, houses, carriages, concerts, gloves, walking sticks, door knockers, railway stations, cathedrals, and any other things one may choose to tabulate are unnecessary. When Omar Khayyam says, A book of verse beneath the bough, a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou, sitting beside me in the paradise, a wilderness were paradise enow. It is clear that he speaks fully as much ascetically as he does aesthetically. He makes a list of things and says that he wants no more. The same thing was done by a medieval monk. Examples might, of course, be multiplied a hundredfold. One of the most genuinely poetical of our younger poets says, as the one thing certain, that from quiet home and first beginning, out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends. Here we have a perfect example of the main important fact that all true joy expresses itself in terms of asceticism. But if in any case it should happen that a class or a generation lose the sense of the peculiar kind of joy which is being celebrated, they immediately begin to call the enjoyers of that joy gloomy and self-destroying. The most formidable liberal philosophers have called the monks melancholy, because they denied themselves the pleasures of liberty and marriage. They might as well call the trippers on a bank holiday melancholy, because they deny themselves, as a rule, the pleasures of silence and meditation. A simpler and stronger example is, however, to hand. If ever it should happen that the system of English athletics should vanish from the public schools and the universities, if science should supply some new and non-competitive manner of perfecting the physique, if public ethics swung round to an attitude of absolute contempt and indifference toward the feeling called sport, then it is easy to see what would happen. Future historians would simply state that in the dark days of Queen Victoria, Young men at Oxford and Cambridge were subjected to a horrible sort of religious torture. They were forbidden by fantastic monastic rules to indulge in wine or tobacco during certain arbitrarily fixed periods of time before certain brutal fights and festivals. Bigots insisted on their rising at unearthly hours and running violently around fields for no object. Many men ruined their health in these dens of superstition. Many died there. All this is perfectly true and irrefutable. Athleticism in England is an asceticism as much as the monastic rules. Men have overstrained themselves and killed themselves through English athleticism. 
there is one difference and one only we do feel the love of sport we do not feel the love of religious offices we see only the price in the one case and only the purchase in the other the only question that remains is what was the joy of the old christian ascetics of which their asceticism was merely the purchasing price the mere possibility of the query is an extraordinary example of the way in which we miss the main points of human history we are looking at humanity too close and see only the details and not the vast and dominant features we look at the rise of christianity and conceive it as a rise of self abnegation and almost of pessimism it does not occur to us that the mere assertion that this raging and confounding universe is governed by justice and mercy is a piece of staggering optimism fit to set all men capering the detail over which these monks went mad with joy was the universe itself the only thing really worthy of enjoyment the white daylight shone over all the world the endless forest stood up in their order the lightning awoke and the trees fell and the sea gathered into mountains and the ship went down and all these disconnected and meaningless and terrible objects were all part of one dark and fearful conspiracy of goodness one merciless scheme of mercy that this scheme of nature was not accurate or well founded is perfectly tenable but surely it is not tenable that it was not optimistic we insist however upon treating this matter tail foremost we insist that the ascetics were pessimists because they gave up threescore years and ten for an eternity of happiness we forget that the bare proposition of an eternity of happiness is by its very nature ten thousand times more optimistic than ten thousand pagan saturnalias Mr. Adderley's life of Francis of Assisi does not, of course, bring this out, nor does it fully bring out the character of Francis. It has, rather, the tone of a devotional book. A devotional book is an excellent thing, but we do not look in it for the portrait of a man, for the same reason that we do not look in a love sonnet for the portrait of a woman. Because men in such conditions of mind not only apply all virtues to their idol but all virtues in equal quantities there is no outline because the artist cannot bear to put in a black line this blaze of benediction this conflict between lights has its place in poetry not in biography the successful examples of it may be found for instance in the more idealistic odes of spencer the design is sometimes almost indecipherable, for the poet draws in silver upon white. It is natural, of course, that Mr. Adderley should see Francis primarily as the founder of the Franciscan order. We suspect this was only one, perhaps a minor one, of the things that he was. We suspect that one of the minor things that Christ did was to found Christianity. But the vast practical work of Francis is assuredly not to be ignored, for this amazingly unworldly and almost maddeningly simple-minded infant was one of the most consistently successful men that ever fought with this bitter world. It is the custom to say that the secret of such men is their profound belief in themselves, and this is true, but not all the truth. Workhouses and lunatic asylums are thronged with men who believe in themselves of francis it is far truer to say that the secret of his success was his profound belief in other people and it is the lack of this that has commonly been the curse of these obscure napoleons francis always assumed that everyone must be just as anxious about their common relative the water rat as he was he planned a visit to the emperor to draw his attention to the needs of his little sisters the larks he used to talk to any thieves and robbers he met about their misfortune in being unable to give rein to their desire for holiness 
it was an innocent habit and doubtless the robbers often got round him as the phrase goes quite as often however they discovered that he had got round them and discovered the other side the side of secret nobility conceiving of saint francis as primarily the founder of the franciscan order mr adderley opens his narrative with an admirable sketch of the history of monasticism in europe which is certainly the best thing in the book he distinguishes clearly and fairly between the manichaean ideal that underlies so much of eastern monasticism and the ideal of self-discipline which never wholly vanished from the christian form but he does not throw any light on what must be for the outsider the absorbing problem of this catholic asceticism for the excellent reason that not being an outsider he does not find it a problem at all to most people however there is a fascinating inconsistency in the position of saint francis he expresses in loftier and bolder language than any earthly thinker the conception that laughter is as divine as tears he called his monks the mountebanks of god he never forgot to take pleasure in a bird as it flashed past him or a drop of water as it fell from his finger he was perhaps the happiest of the sons of men yet this man undoubtedly founded his whole polity on the negation of what we think the most imperious necessities in his three vows of poverty chastity and obedience he denied to himself and those he loved most property love and liberty why was it that the most large-hearted and poetic spirits of that age found their most congenial atmosphere in these awful renunciations why did he who loved where all men were blind seek to blind himself where all men loved why was he a monk and not a troubadour these questions are far too large to be answered fully here but in any life of francis they ought at least to have been asked we have a suspicion that if they were answered we should suddenly find that much of the enigma of this sullen time of ours was answered also so it was with the monks the two great parties in human affairs are only the party which sees life black against white and the party which sees white against black the party which macerates and blackens itself with sacrifice because the background is full of the blaze of a universal mercy and the party which crowns itself with flowers and lights itself with bridal torches because it stands against a black curtain of incalculable night the revelers are old and the monks are young it was the monks who were the spendthrifts of happiness and we who are its misers doubtless as is apparent from mr adderley's book the clear and tranquil life of the three vows had a fine and delicate effect on the genius of francis he was primarily a poet the perfection of his literary instinct is shown in his naming the fire brother and the water sister in the quaint demagogic dexterity of the appeal in the sermon to the fishes that they alone were saved in the flood in the amazingly minute and graphic dramatization of the life disappointments and excuses of any shrub or beast that he happened to be addressing his genius has a curious resemblance to that of burns but if he avoided the weaknesses of burns verses to animals the occasional morbidity the bombast and moralization on himself the credit is surely due to a cleaner and more transparent life the general attitude of st francis like that of his master embodied a kind of terrible common sense the famous remark of the caterpillar in alice in wonderland why not impresses us as his general motto he could not see why he should not be on good terms with all things the pomp of war and ambition the great empire of the middle ages and all its fellows begin to look tawdry and top-heavy under the rationality of that innocent stare his questions were blasting 
and devastating, like the questions of a child. He would not have been afraid even of the nightmares of cosmogony, for he had no fear in him. To him the world was small, not because he had any views as to its size, but for the reason that gossiping ladies find it small, because so many relatives were to be found in it. If you had taken him to the loneliest star that the madness of an astronomer can conceive, he would have only beheld in it the features of a new friend. End of chapter Francis